Good afternoon. I think uh, most uh, people probably know me, but just as a quick uh, introduction. Um, I'm Derek H. Giddos. The H stands for happy, as in I'm happy to be here, and even happier that I'm not presenting to an empty room. I was uh, getting a little worried uh, over the last couple of days. So I know that uh, what we may lack in uh, quantity, we make up for quality in terms of the people who are here, because clearly you are dedicated to learn more about what's going on with OTM. Uh, I head up the product strategy function at Oracle that's responsible for our logistics products. Um, and uh, as product strategy, our, our job is to plan out the long-term, medium-term, short-term roadmap for, for our products. And what I want to do here this afternoon over the next 45 minutes of my presentation and then Q&A is give you some insights as to where we are taking the product, some projects that we have uh, either currently working on or we have in our hopper of ideas that we want to be able to make progress on over the next uh, you know, couple of years. I will not talk about every single thing that we are working on because that is uh, too much even for me to try to cram into, into a single presentation. Uh, I also, you know, for those of you who have seen me do presentations before, I usually try to begin with some kind of, you know, a little bit of, uh, little bit of humor. Uh, but I also tried to come up with something funny that wasn't politically related, and then I decided I couldn't do it because there just isn't anything else to talk about. It's funny. Uh, politics has sort of monopolized the, the comedy industry. So I will get right into it uh, with the least funny slide that I have, which, of course, is the safe harbor statement. Uh, which just a reminder again, our, our roadmap plans, uh, kind of like the weather, uh, you know, are subject to change. And I'll give you the best information and the best guidance based off of where we are now. So before I get right into the products, uh, the roadmap parts, uh, give you a little sense for where we are in our current state. Uh, again, logistics people planning how to how to go somewhere. Same thing with software. So in order to plan our roadmap, we have to have a good understanding of, of where we are and where we, where we need to improve uh, and then determine the best way to move forward. We are already in a very enviable position in terms of our spot in the market in that we are number one. Uh, now every software vendor, I would say, maybe every company likes to say they're, they're the leader or they're leading. Uh, we are the leader. Uh, as validated by third-party uh, research firms like Gartner, leader in terms of our share of the market, transportation software market, uh, and also leader in, in terms of functional capabilities. So basically, my job and my uh, product strategy team's job is to not mess that up. All right? So we just need to continue the roadmap, uh, continue to invest in areas based off of how we see the market evolving and, and feedback from uh, feed, feedback from folks like you. Uh, if I look back over the last year, 2019, it was a, a very, very good year for us. I feel like I kind of say that same thing every year. Uh, and, you know, I'm fortunate, we're fortunate enough that we've, we've continued on this 20-year journey of success. Uh, last year, we added uh, in the neighborhood of about 100, maybe a little more than 100 net new companies around the world. So companies who are using OTM for the, for the very first time. Uh, we also see a lot of customer success uh, as far as not just people buying our product, which is one good thing, uh, of course, but going on and actually implementing and, and seeing success. And in the cloud world, what is really, really important, uh, just as much as you know, obviously selling the software the first time, is renewals. Because now we don't just sell a software you take home and you know, uh, put it on a shelf somewhere. Uh, it's a subscription, so if you're not happy with it and the subscription comes due, you can you know, cancel and, and walk away. So we see a very strong uh, growth in new customers as well as companies who they, they use it, they like it, they renew it, they keep, they keep using it. Our ecosystem continues to grow. The ecosystem consists of folks like you here in this room, you know, our customers, our partners, and I'll give you some insights on one particular area where we've been seeing a lot of growth around partner solutions and around digital freight markets. Um, we have a lot of product innovation. Jim highlighted just some of the, you know, the number of releases uh, and number of enhancements and, and, and such. Uh, and hopefully you'll see over the next uh, the remainder of my time here that the product innovation is very much uh, going to continue. And as I said, all these things combined, the cust our customer success, the ecosystem that, that continues to grow, 
our product innovation, that's what le gets us to that market leadership position. And, uh, you know, I have two kids that are about to enter college, uh, one starting in the fall and one two years from now. And uh, in case you're not familiar, you know, American colleges are extremely expensive, so I'm going to have to keep on working and I have to maintain this product leadership, I would say. And they're pretty smart kids, so I know they're probably going to get PhD, so that this is at least another 10, 12 years that I want to have to keep doing this job and we'll have to stay number one. All right. So as I say, the, the customer success is, is tremendous, and uh, one of the ways that I kind of um, keep track of that is, so for all the, all the customers who present in forums like this, at the SIG conferences or Oracle events, uh, I keep track of all that, and so all the logos that I put up here, these are all companies, at least ones that I'm aware of, that presented in some uh, user group or other, or other Oracle event in 2019. I think there's 40 some uh, organizations represented there. Um, and as you can see, if you're familiar with all these companies, it, it's a wide range of organizations, different industries, different geographic regions, different types of products, different types of transportation needs. And the one thing they have in common, of course, is they use what I've heard is a really good transportation system. So. Um, and then we have the magic quadrant, so this is another way that we measure our leadership or our kind of position in the market besides, you know, from a revenue perspective, you know, how are we perceived uh, in terms of the way the magic quadrant works is one dimension is uh, the ability to execute, which is really a measure of how good a product we have today. Uh, and then the second dimension is completeness of vision, which is, you know, what is our product strategy and are we working on the sorts of things that Gartner views as you know, critical to success in the coming, in the coming years. Um, Gartner has produced this magic quadrant for transportation systems starting in 2006 uh, and we've been in that leader's quadrant and in that top spot uh, every single time. Right? And remember what I said before, I got at least a decade to, uh, of work ahead so my goal is to make sure that dot, that, that dot stays there. And there is a new one coming out, by the way. I actually saw a draft version earlier this week. No shock, but I, th I think we're still going to be in a good, in good position afterwards. All right. So believe it or not, I, I did put this slide together before the current end of civilization, as we know it, um, on what kind of the what are the major you know, business imperatives that organizations have with respect to their logistics functions. And logistics is really you know, figuring out how to balance two competing, if you will, sometimes objectives, which is, you know, how do you deliver the best service, you know, deliver 100% on time and in the right quantity and quality and location, you know, the perfect order metric. And at the same time, do that in a, in a way that maximizes or, or minimizes your costs and maximizes the utilization and productivity of your, of your resources, your assets, your people. And so finding that balance, you know, what, what is the right balance for any organization may, may vary a bit, but those are really the, the two things that we all try to achieve in a logistics function. And then the third one, of course, is that we don't live in a static world. <laughs> we have disruptive forces, sometimes of our own making, uh, other times external, in terms of regulatory changes, um, in terms of mergers and acquisitions, in terms of new products, new suppliers, changes in, in the supply chain. So we need to, from a, a software perspective and from an organization perspective, we need to maintain that optimal um, balance between providing the best level of service at the best cost, subject to the fact that these changes, changes are occurring. So our goal is, again, to provide capabilities in our product that enable you to, to optimize uh, those, those three things. And so um, Jim went to five. I'm going to go with four. Four is kind of my favorite number, I guess, uh, if you've seen me present in the past. So I'm going to talk about our roadmap of kind of these four themes, four, four buckets. So functional, disruptive technology, extensibility, and, and customer driven. So on the functional side, I'll talk about things like our new logistics network modeling capability work we're doing around proving how we handle ocean freight and some other scenarios, trade agreements, et cetera, a bunch of functional things. 
On the disruptive technology side, I'll, I'll talk about work we've done and some new work we've just finished completing in terms of how we use uh, our IoT platform, uh, some work we have underway in the realm of artificial intelligence, <coughs> blockchain, and chatbots. I think I covered all the major you know, cool tech stuff. On the extensibility front, uh, I'll talk and give you some examples of the work we're doing there in terms of mobile and some next generation user experience work, and then customer driven. So again, a lot of how we determine you know, where, we, uh, where we invest our resources and, and what is a priority comes from the feedback uh, that, uh, that we receive from you. And I know there's at least one customer who's already mastered how to use Cloud Customer Connect. Uh, so if you're not familiar with this, uh, please, uh, please become familiar with it. Uh, so this is available to all the customers, uh, Cloud Customer cloud.oracle.com slash community. Uh, and two, two important functions here. One is provides forums. So that's a means for you to pose questions to the broader community. So every customer, you know, if you have a question about how do I do this, that, or the other thing, uh, those forums are also moderated by our product development team. So there's experts kind of standing by. Uh, and then the other aspect is what we call the ideas lab, which is, um, in the old days, you would log a, an enhancement request through support. Uh, now we use the ideas lab function to capture that input. And it comes with the uh, additional capability in that multiple customers can provide input on the enhancement, the idea that you have. So if an idea gets a lot of support, a lot of you know, likes, if you will, then that's obviously a good indication for us that that's, that's an idea that we you know, should pay attention to and, you know, try to try to incorporate in our roadmap. And so if you saw in the Adeo presentation, I actually had the links to the, the reference in the, uh, to that specific idea. Okay, so one example of how that customer input, you know, makes its way into the product is we've been working on a project, uh, we start this year or so ago, uh, around improving uh, ocean freight management capabilities inside of OTM. Now, we already have ocean freight related functionality. We have customers who are, who are using it. Um, but there's also, you know, kind of always room for improvement. And so we uh, actually set up a working group and collected input from a number of organizations. I was going to say some of them are here in the room, but I think those companies that I thought would be here in the room are not actually not in the room today. Uh, but, but regardless, it's a great example of how that type of you know, direct customer input, we, we, we not only welcome, we, we encourage and want that feedback for how we can improve the product. Uh, and so just give you an example of some of the things that this will manifest itself in, no pun intended, manifest, it's a little transportation humor, I tried to slip under. Um, will be things like the pre-order booking request, um, which is to say we have to start booking transportation ocean capacity in advance of actually having the real transportation order and how to handle that process. Uh, of course, lots of times those orders involve multiple pieces of equipment because it's not just one container, maybe a dozen containers or more and managing that. One of our lovely set of features around shipment groups and how to make shipment groups. I got a double thumbs up from Mary Beth, so plug for shipment groups. Uh, managing actual freight and ship units, and, on and on and on. So a lot of good new capabilities motivated by, again, the input from these customers around ocean, but it's not going to be limited to ocean. We were just having a hallway conversation earlier. So whether uh, you know, you're having to deal with multiple, you know, splitting out a, an invoice and paying by multiple parties, which is something that occurs here, that'll help in other scenarios as well. All right. So. Um, on to the other kind of major functional things. Uh, we presented uh, in the past on Oracle Logistics Network Modeling and, and the roadmap for that. So I'd like to think this is one of those areas where, you know, indeed the stuff that Giddo's guy said a few years ago did actually come to, uh, come to reality. Uh, we introduced the Logistics Network Modeling uh, last year, it came out in uh, the 19B. Uh, and this is designed to, again, help, uh, help organizations, not just from, obviously OTM is very operationally focused, but to help organizations from a tactical and strategic uh, planning perspective. So the idea here is that 
you can very easily analyze changes or potential disruptions uh, in your transportation network in order to help fashion the, the most appropriate response. And so I've just listed out uh, a, few, a few examples of what those might be. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this one because we have a dedicated session uh, tomorrow that, that Srini will, will be walking through. Uh, but the cool thing, the highlights about Oracle Logistics Network Modeling, unlike other transportation modeling tools, this is not a standalone tool, it's an embedded component of, of OTM. So everyone who's already using OTM, and if you're on the cloud, you already have Logistics Network Modeling. Uh, you may need, well not may, you do need to license it, uh, so there's a little additional money. Remember, kids in college, you know, someone's got to pay for that. Um, but, but it is available. You could take a look at it, kind of, kind of see what's there. Um, so one, that's a convenience feature because for those people who are already familiar with all the concepts that OTM has and how to navigate the application and how uh, you know, rates are modeled and all that sort of thing, logistics network modeling takes advantage of all that. You don't have to do any additional integration work. You don't have to do any additional sort of conceptual gymnastics of how do I take my shipment history and put it into my modeling tool, or my rates, how do I put it into my modeling tool? We use the exact same data. Um, and it leverages the same uh, logic that we use operationally to plan shipment. So what that means for us then is we can come up with very accurate simulations of how a network would operate given a set of inputs. So if we change the source on where we're going to ship these orders, or if we uh, look at a potential change in a rate, or a new uh, a new way of shipping goods from one part of the world to the other, we can come up with very accurate assessments of what that would mean in reality if you were to indeed uh, implement those changes. Okay. So product-wise, again, dedicated workbench that we, that we ship with that allows you to manage your projects and the scenarios within a, within a project that you are analyzing. And then, of course, different means to view the, view the output of those simulations including uh, a dedicated set of uh, analytics using our same business intelligence engine that we use for other analytical purposes uh, so that you can, again, assess the outcome of a particular scenario and compare across, uh, across scenarios. So we have a very uh, active roadmap around the product because this particular module is the, the newest part of, uh, of OTM. Uh, so based off of our initial set of users, we'll, we'll continue to advance that product uh, and, and evolve it. Uh, next up, I want to talk a little bit about uh, trade agreements. Um, I'm, there may not be too many uh, global trade management users uh, here in the room, uh, but we have uh, seen tremendous, not just interest, but growth in companies who are using the combination of our transportation and global trade management product together to support uh, their international logistics, so the physical product movement and the import-export compliance-related functions. And so one area that we've invested in, and uh, whether it was you know, by, by plan or just fortuitous timing, was this area of free trade agreements or preferential trade agreements. And you know, bless the hearts of politicians, they are making trade more complicated, which makes uh, software solutions more valuable uh, in, in order to manage it. Uh, there are, depending on how you count them, there's literally you know, hundreds of different preferential trade agreements in, in place today. And so what we've done, um, last year we introduced the first phase of this solution, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, it's, it's a solution that enables organizations to identify, based off the products that you're purchasing, which products from which suppliers are eligible for preferential treatment under a given trade agreement. And then also provide you the tools to then execute on that. So typically the way this works is, you know, there's a preferential trade agreement in place. You're going to source a product from a supplier. When you import that product, you have to provide the appropriate documentation to the authority that is the evidence that shows that it indeed meets the requirements. So we built a screening engine that will look at those, those products that you're sourcing or potentially sourcing, look at the requirements of a particular trade agreement, and flag that product to say, okay, well, this product is eligible under this particular agreement, and the preferred duty rate that you could get on that is 2% instead of the standard 20, whatever the numbers are. 
And then you can work with your suppliers and run what we call a campaign, which is a, a means to collect the necessary documentation from those suppliers so that you have those certificates on hand to give to your broker or to use in your, in your import process. The next phase of that is the sell side part of trade agreement. So if you're a manufacturer or distributor, you know, you're selling products, uh, your customers may be asking the same thing of you. They will say, hey, can you prove, yes, I know you, you know, shipped it from your factory in, in Vietnam, but is it really a you know, Vietnam product from a, in terms of the requirements of this particular trade agreement, or does it qualify under the new, the new US, Mexico, Canada trade agreement, those types of things. So we're building, again, expanding our engine here to be able to analyze the uh, products that you're manufacturing or that you're distributing to see whether, again, they qualify for that preferential trade agreement treatment and then be able to produce the certificate that you could then hand on to your, uh, to your end customer. And then we're going to continue on this path of, again, providing tools to help organizations minimize uh, their, their, the duties that they pay. Uh, so programs like uh, duty drawback and uh, bonded warehouses, foreign trade zones, these are all basically different flavors of the same thing, which is, you know, products come into a location or a region, products go out. Uh, and again, if you can show that you meet the requirements of a particular program, then the duty you might have paid on the products that you imported, you can either get some or all of that back uh, if you uh, use that product in another product that you then, then shipped out. All right. So digital freight markets was having just a little conversation on this topic uh, over lunch. One of the things that we've seen that's pretty new uh, in the transportation market uh, over the last year or two is this concept of digital freight brokers or digital freight markets, as I called it here. Um, so these are organizations like uh, Uber Freight, uh, LoadSmart, Convoy. There are many others. It's a very hot uh, venture capital topic these days. Uh, some people have twigged on to the fact that there's literally billions and billions of dollars spent on logistics and transportation, and maybe there's opportunities in some ways to make those functions more, more efficient. Now, <clears throat> with inside of OTM today, and for most organizations, your, your goods move under contract. You have contract carriers, you have dedicated carriers, or maybe preferred carriers on, on a given set of lanes, and you have defined rates, and you figured out how to load them into OTM, or you used a tool to do that, uh, and you've got defined capacities and all that kind of goodness, and then OTM uses that information to figure out what's the right carrier for a given shipment. Uh, what can happen, though, of course, is maybe you don't have enough capacity on a given, on a given day, or your uh, preferred carrier has some other issue, they can't, they can't move the shipment, or you're shipping goods in a place that you don't normally do, and therefore you don't, you don't have carrier set up. The digital freight market providers are trying to fill that need. They are trying to provide this sort of on-demand spot, if you will, dynamic capacity, so that, and to make that process easier. So our goal as a transportation product is we, of course, want you we're managing all your transportation activity in OTM. We want to monopolize that. Can I say the word monopolize and have it record? Um, and so what that means is we are providing a mechanism for, as an OTM user, to interact with those digital freight markets just as you would other, other carriers. And the key difference here, or one of the key differences, is that you don't have contract rates with the digital freight markets. In most cases, it's, it's a dynamic price. So there's no rates to preload into OTM. And so what our new uh, partners have done is taken advantage actually of a feature we've had quite, for quite some time, which is our ability to call out to external rating engines. So what that means is uh, if you're using uh, LoadSmart or Uber Freight or any of these guys, from within side of OTM, you can get a real-time view of what their capacity, you know, could they take that shipment and at what price. And of course, if that's how you want to ship it, then the rest of the execution flow uh, in terms of you know, tendering the shipment, booking the shipment, tracking the shipment, paying the shipment, all, all acts the same. And so there was a great presentation done last August in Philadelphia from Coca-Cola and LoadSmart, uh, just as an example of how that, how that works. 
So we, we will continue to invest as far as helping these digital freight markets become, build these integrations and become you know, certified partners for us. Uh, and then what that means for you as an OTM user, of course, then is you can very easily begin to, if you want to use that type of capacity in your network, be able to transact business with them with not a whole lot of additional work. Okay. Uh, next up is the logistics cloud. Uh, so as Jim talked about in his uh, presentation, um, you know, we acquired a, a company called Logfire a few years ago, which is a warehouse management system provider. So one of the areas uh, we have been, been working on since the acquisition is how can we bring these two products uh, together in order and, and deliver solutions that take advantage of having you know, a transportation system and a, and a warehouse management system together. Recently, is we've, we've built out a, what we call a sample integration flow. So this is a set of use cases, or I should say a set of integrations around a particular use case of, this one is basically a kind of an outbound shipping scenario. So you have a warehouse, a distribution center, and you're shipping goods from there to fulfill customer orders or what have you. Uh, and so we've built out a set of predefined integrations uh, for that use case that brings together the combination of OTM for doing the planning and execution of those shipments, and our WMS cloud for handling the wave planning, picking, pick, pack, ship uh, process. Right? So if you're using OTM and WMS together, and you want to figure out well, how we're going to integrate those two products, we have, a, again, a set of sample integrations that you could take advantage of um, to get that, get that project rolling. And how we deliver it? The technology that we utilize is uh, what we call OIC, not to be confused with OCI. So this is Oracle Integration Cloud Service, which is a cloud-based middleware, if you will. And so we have these predefined flows, which are basically the object-to-object -object mappings and logic around that that you can uh, take advantage of and begin to use right away, uh, as well as use that as a starting point, if you will, if you want to kind of extend upon that out-of-the-box integration. All right. Uh, another important area for us has been around IoT, so now I'm going to start to get into some of my disruptive technology bits. Um, but the first example I'll talk about IoT is actually another, another example of how we're bringing our logistics solutions together. So we've been investing in IoT for quite some time at Oracle. We have a number of IoT solutions uh, already in place. Our, our high-level strategy around IoT is that it's not the technology itself isn't really I didn't even say all that, all that interesting. What is, what is valuable is how can we use that technology inside of our supply chain applications in terms of our supply, and make our supply chain functions better, whether that's from a maintenance perspective, a manufacturing perspective, or of course, most important, which is logistics. And so in past uh, pre presentations, I've talked about the work we've done with IoT around cargo and asset tracking. So this is the means if you operate your own fleet, for example, or you have a, a you know, private fleet or dedicated fleet, and you want to be able to not only track the real-time location, but to monitor the status of the cargo. Maybe it's you know, a temperature-sensitive good. You want to monitor the be driving behavior uh, of the person behind the, behind the wheel. Uh, you want to monitor the condition, operating characteristics of the engine. We have an IoT solution that is designed to, to collect that data uh, and provide that inf information to you know, the fleet manager and, and, and those folks. But in addition to that, we've built an out-of-the-box integration with OTM. So I can take my shipments that I've planned in OTM and I'm going to you know, use a, a fleet to serve and I can automatically connect those two solutions together so that I can, for example, uh, based off of my geofencing of the route and the locations, automatically infer shipment status updates like the vehicle has you know, arrived at the origin location, the vehicle has left, the vehicle is en route, the vehicle is now following a route that I didn't expect it to take, and have those status updates automatically come back into OTM. So that's a solution we already had. We did that maybe a year and a half or so ago. What's new is we've now brought our warehouse management system into the mix. And so now we have a, an IoT solution that uh, helps both from a transportation and a warehousing perspective around the topic of yard and dock management. Okay. So the goal here is that 
um, we can help automate the process of getting the trailer to the, to, the right, to the right dock door and get loaded or unloaded and out of the facility in, in the most efficient way possible. And I'll just illustrate it, the solution with kind of a high level kind of, kind of walkthrough. So of course from OTM, we plan our shipment. So this is an example of, a, of an outbound shipment. So goods are uh, gonna be picked up at a distribution center, I think in Kansas City, Missouri, it's not Kansas. Uh, and it's going to be going to, uh, to Atlanta. So we plan that shipment in OTM as you normally do. That shipment is now, you know, you know been tendered off. It's going to be executed. Uh, if you're using our WMS, then that same shipment is going to become a, a planned load inside of WMS so that it can, again, begin to plan the work inside the warehouse facility, including the dock door assignment process. So this is a new, new shipment, so we may not have that dock door assigned yet. That same shipment uh, is also set up in the IoT platform. So now we're in our IoT product monitoring. In this case, we are monitoring our warehouse facility. So we've geofenced our facility. And we are tracking one of those little icons there. That's the asset, that's the truck that's, and trailer that's coming in to pick up that shipment that's gonna be going out, out to Atlanta. And so we're using that updated planned arrival time to help plan at a warehouse level the dock door assignment when that, when that trailer uh, arrives, right? So let's say you know, the truck arrives on when it's supposed to. Um, again, we have a mobile app if, if that's something you're interested in, so we can automatically tell the driver or the, the, the guard at the gate check-in, you know, what, what, is that, what is that truck supposed to do? Should go, in this case, go immediately to outbound dock number five, or maybe all the dock doors are are occupied, so the recommendation would be go to this parking spot, uh, and once once a new dock door is available, then we'll dispatch it to get it moved into the into the outbound loading facility, outbound loading door. So again, we're trying to bring together not just these products from an integration perspective, but bring them together to provide these types of uh, solutions that would otherwise be be very difficult uh, for you to do and enable it in this case with, I, with IoT as the basis for doing that asset, asset tracking and process automation. Okay. The next topic I wanna to talk a little bit about is uh, blockchain, gotta slip in some blockchain. Um, but again, we've, we've tried to take a very pragmatic approach, whether it's IoT or blockchain, where we don't wanna build we don't just want to have a blockchain thing or an IoT thing because that's, that's, that's a you know, kind of a popular buzzword. We want to be able to solve real supply chain or logistics problems. And as uh, was highlighted, I think in Mark's uh, brief Project 44 presentation, supply chain visibility, traceability, it, it is a number one uh, priority, number one concern. Uh, for organizations for a number of reasons. Again, not just visibility to where products are, uh, knowing uh, where they have been, knowing what has happened with that product from a, from a quality perspective, from a, a fraud prevention perspective, from a regulatory compliance perspective. So a lot of business reasons driving the need for this visibility and, and traceability. Uh, and it just so happens that you know, blockchain as a technology has a lot of characteristics, compelling characteristics that lend itself as, as a good technology to be applied to address this particular supply chain problem. And so what we have done at Oracle is we built a new product that we launched last uh, summer, uh, which we call the Oracle Intelligent Track and Trace Cloud. Uh, happens to be based on blockchain. We don't even put blockchain in the name, but the underlying technology that supports this solution uh, is, is a blockchain based one. But basically what you can do is you can define different uh, supply chain business processes. So whether that's around outbound sales order fulfillment or inbound, uh, uh, inbound uh, parts and components coming into your manufacturing sites or products moving between facilities in your supply chain, define which trading partners are involved, whether those are internal or external, carriers, 3PLs, suppliers, et cetera. What, what transactions, what documents are gonna be associated with them and then begin to collect uh, collect that information and have that information available not just to your organization but to all the participants that you have in that blockchain network. And what we have done, because of course this isn't the blockchain product strategy updates for transportation, 
is we have built um, or have an integration such that uh, the shipments that reside in OTM, those planned and actual shipments and shipment statuses, that information can be published and it put into that blockchain automatically. Right? So if you're using OTM to manage the transportation activity, then that, the, that shipment data, eventually the global trade data as well, will all be available in that, in that blockchain. And again, some of these solutions can then build on each other. So we talked about, I talked about IoT a few minutes ago. One of the use cases for IoT is not just location monitoring, but cargo condition monitoring. So again, if you have temperature sensitive goods, you want, you want to know, was there a temperature, you know, did I have a, a variation in temperature that went above the control limit? The I, IoT can help detect that. That can be a shipment status update inside of OTM. And that can also be an event that, that we're gonna log in the blockchain. Uh, in our intelligent track and trace and have that, you know, that visibility and traceability, what happened with that product and, and when it occurred. All right. Um, and then my last disruptive technology one, the, which is the one I think actually is the most kind of, kind of interesting, um, which is the work we're doing around uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And again, this is part of a broad initiative at Oracle. We're trying to make our supply chain, again, embed these technologies to make our supply chain applications better, smarter, faster. And so we've already been uh, applying these technologies in a number of different areas in maintenance and in manufacturing uh, in demand planning and now also in transportation. And based off of some, some input that we received from uh, customers and our own research, we looked at a number of different potential use cases and we settled on transit time and ETA, or expected time of arrival, calculations as, as a use case that would, one, provide a lot of value if we could help do that better than how it's done today, uh, and that the artificial intelligence technologies that we have to choose from are, you know, lend themselves to addressing this particular need. So the goal here is that we would develop, and I'll talk a little bit about how it works in a moment, develop a machine learning based model that would calculate the expected transit time for a given order or a given shipment. So instead of relying solely on, say, the published schedules of your uh, ocean freight providers or just looking at uh, distance that the truck needs to, uh, to drive as the basis for calculating those expected times, we want to be able to develop a machine learning model that's using historical observations as the basis for predicting those transit times uh, when, when new shipments are being created or planned or being, or being executed. So those three use cases are, I have a new order, what's the total transit time? I'm planning a shipment, what's the expected arrival departure time along the locations in that shipment? And as that shipment is executing, being able to update the downstream expected arrival times using a uh, machine learning based prediction. How we are doing it um, in its kind of initial version that we're, we're actively working on, so this is a project that we are actively developing, uh, is that we would use as the basis for training this model all of the historical shipment data that you already have in OTM. So you don't need to do anything. Well, you have to buy OTM, which you should do anyway. And then as you process you know, your shipments in it, you are building up that historical database of shipping activity. That historical database then becomes the input to our uh, machine learning model in terms of training the model based off of those historical observations. Now, our goal is that eventually uh, we want to uh, build upon this initial framework by one, enabling that training to occur across multiple customers. So in other words, uh, give you the ability to have your historical data and the historical data of other customers to be used as the basis for doing the training. Obviously, you know, with all the various data privacy concerns, et cetera, uh, accounted for, the value in that is no matter how big you are, no one ships products on every, to every single place in the, in the world. So if we get more, and the way machine learning models work, generally speaking, is the more observations you have, the better the, better the models are. The other aspect of growth is we want to combine uh, other external sources of data, like external, um, you know, what was the, uh, you know, what were the traffic conditions at that time? What were the weather conditions at that time? 
and use those observations as well as inputs for, for, for the training. The net result, again, what the end user sees, your transportation users see, uh, and again, we've just started to begin to work on kind of mocking up what the user experience would look like, is to provide them with, in addition to how we provide what's the projected estimated arrival and departure times today, provide additional uh, fields, additional uh, transit and ETA times that are based off of that model. So you could see and compare side by side, you know, my, based off of my standard transit times and what the carrier tells me it should, you know, get from, from Shanghai to Kansas City in this much time. Based off of my machine learning model, though, it's telling me, you know, instead of 27 days of transit, that's going to be 33, right? And provide feedback over time as to how accurate those machine learning predictions were, basically the confidence factor uh, in, that, in that machine learning prediction. So we've done some work already in terms of, or not some work, we've done a lot of work in proving that these models can come up with a better answer. Uh, and at the moment, we're working to actually implement this, what we had done as sort of proof of concept into core uh, OTM features. It will, I will caution you, it, it will require some additional money from you because this is being built off of a machine learning platform that we have at Oracle. We're not building our, our, our own. Uh, and so there may be, not maybe, there will be some additional um, subscription required. Okay. So in terms of the extensibility uh, theme, uh, we've presented at this event and, and others, uh, in fact, we've had some dedicated sessions around all the work we're doing with providing REST services. So REST is a integration architecture, if you like. Um, but what I want to do is talk about you know, why, we, why, why we do that, what's the value of having REST services. So there's a number of use cases. You'll notice there are four because it's a great number. So I'll talk about digital assistants or chatbots, uh, mobile apps, customization, building third-party applications, uh, as well as robotic process automation. These are all use cases that by having the REST services in OTM and GTM to be able to add, update uh, uh, business objects, shipments, orders, et cetera, uh, it enables you, enables us to deliver these types of uh, solutions. So the one that we are actually been working on for a while and have planned uh, to come out over the next, uh, within the next 12 months, is a predefined, pre-built digital assistant for OTM. So a digital assistant or chatbot, if you're not familiar with those, again, it's a, it's a natural language-based input into, uh, into the system. So rather than having to log into, in this particular use case, rather than having to log into OTM uh, or call up someone who has OTM access and look up the status of a particular shipment or order, we, we're looking to enable that order status, that shipment status inquiry through a digital assistant. So using your smartphone, using your favorite um, messaging platform, like uh, or collaboration platforms like Slack or Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp and so forth, be able to interact on the back end with OTM without having to go to OTM at all. And so the most popular use case after, again, getting customer input was around, around those order and shipment status uh, updates. Right? So, It'll still provide a uh, authentication in the sense that you still have to be a, a valid OTM user. But once you've once you've logged in, uh, then you can, without having to actually go to OTM, ask questions like, you know, where's my where's my stuff, where's my orders, that type of thing. Uh, getting close to the end, so you may have noticed in our PowerPoint templates, or, or if you had our colleagues who attended Open World uh, last fall, we've undertaken a very big rebranding exercise at Oracle we call Project uh, Redwood. Uh, and it's, it's more than new PowerPoint uh, templates, of course. Uh, it's a whole new, it's, it's a recognition that our industry has changed and Oracle has changed and that we're you know, much more of a service-oriented company. We're not selling licensed software anymore. We're providing transportation services or you know, transportation management as a service or financial capabilities as a service. 
And so we need to kind of rethink how we, how we approach our customers. Uh, and so we wanted to capture that in the, not just the look and feel of our, of our website and our PowerPoint, but also improve how we build out the user experience, the user interfaces of our products. And so you'll see a lot coming from Oracle over the coming months and years in terms of new user interfaces in our existing products and new products that leverage these new technologies uh, built off of this Redwood UI, as we call it. And so the one area that we're looking to uh, take this on within the OTM domain uh, will be in the area of our mobile app. So we have an existing mobile application. It's built on a, uh, what was the phrase we used, John? Jim, it's a technologically complete platform at this point. Uh, so our ability to kind of enhance and do a lot more with it is, is, is somewhat limited. Uh, so we're gonna look to use Visual Builder Visual uh, VBCS, along with the Redwood UI themes as the, as the means to build out our next generation mobile app as part of, our, part of our roadmap. And then the last topic I had was a little bit around business intelligence and analytics. This is another uh, major kind of investment for Oracle as a whole, which is also uh, kind of trickling down to us in the logistics world. We started delivering last year the first set of our, of our new um, analytics applications that sit on top of um, our products, so sit on top of our financial products, for example. And the supply chain version of these new analytics capabilities are beginning to be deployed this year, beginning with uh, initially with support for our procurement, cloud products, and then an order management inventory. Uh, and we will also, uh, we're not in 2020, maybe starting the year or so after that, begin to roll in the logistics content into, uh, into this new analytics framework as well. All right, so I think that's all I had, and I'm, I did leave my 10 minutes or so for questions, so I'll be happy to take, take any questions.